Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Let's try for the finish of the great book of Daniel. Uh, and um, so with that, the fact that the false Messiah has already appeared on earth, Paul giving a backup from verse 36 and 7 of this 11th chapter of this vile person that we were introduced to back in verse 21 of chapter 11. And that vile person, of course, is none other than the spurious Messiah. Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, hey, I want to talk to you about our getting back together with Christ. It's not going to happen until the son of perdition, the vile person, the little horn, Satan, dragon, whatever name you want to call him, is going to appear first, and that's why you're a Christian, is to stand against him. That's the purpose. Now, I wonder how many people are really prepared for that. It's, it is important. That's why your father sent you this letter, explaining it with such clarity that a child can understand. With that having been said, uh, we're going to pick it up after this vile one was to place himself above all that is called God till he calls himself God. Always beware of that. That's dangerous. God doesn't like it. Chapter 11, the great book of Daniel, verse 38. Let's go with it. In that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, it reads, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. In the Hebrew manuscripts, it's obvious he's a little bit superstitious. That's kind of interesting to know, isn't it? It's kind of hard to picture Satan being superstitious, but that's what it says. And who knows, maybe he is. Uh, he's certainly not a follower of our father, so be that as it may. Verse 39, uh, the God of forces means um, I'm big enough to, to root around whoever I want to. It's going to be my way. Or, or the highway, all right? 39 reads, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, one he sets up himself, the spurious Messiah in Satan's name, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for a gain, for a price. This is to say the ten he brings with him, the ten horns, which were the ten toes back in chapter 2, which are not enos, which is to say mortal man, but they're supernatural. And they're going to be able to rule pretty good. You're going, to, you're going to see something you've never seen before. They even destroy three of the mortal rulers of the world, that's to say flesh men, when they take over. I have no doubt that the deadly wound is connected there with. Verse 40. And at the time of the end, when it's just about to consummate, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him with like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. This is when one worldism comes to its completeness. Now we're mentioning chariots and horsemen and so forth until the battle of Haman Gog and Armageddon, which happened simultaneously in two separate locations. Haman Gog referred to in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and of course Armageddon. What is Megiddon? Is Megiddo, and Megiddo in the Hebrew tongue means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan's crowd. Got it. Uh, so what, what you have is full-fledged, in force, ten world rulers that are supernatural, along with Satan himself as the spurious Messiah, the vile person of, of uh, verse 21 of this chapter, in control. 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land, that means Judea itself, 
and many countries shall be overthrown, just simply taken over by what? How, what is his weaponry? Peace and flatteries. Don't ever forget that. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, that's Rush or Russia, and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon, that's to say Lot's children, 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Why? Well, it's one worldism, okay? Verse 43, and he shall give, have power over the treasuries of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the uh, Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps, meaning all of Africa, Libya, and um, um, again, the whole world is going to chase after him. Why? They think he's Almighty God. They think he's the Son. They think he's Messiah. And I could go through all the so-called leaders of every religion, but I choose never to mention other religions, but that gives you a point to, to a Buddhist, it's going to be Buddha, and so on and so forth. That's how he deceives people. Verse 44, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Now, what do you think that's going to be? You've already been told. I don't want you to forget it. What are the tidings that upset him? We covered it in Mark 13 when God's elect began to witness against him and with the Holy Spirit speaking through both the men and the women. As spoken of by Joel the prophet and as it happened on Pentecost Day. Not an unknown language, but absolutely needing no interpreter understood clearly and distinctly in every language of the world all at one time. That's why in the Greek it's called the cloven tongue. All directions. Man can't fake that. Only the Holy Spirit can cause that to come to pass. This upsets him. That's why when I told you the ships of Chittim, it's, the word Chittim means bruisers in the Hebrew tongue. And we are the bruisers that bruise the head of the serpent. We are the bruisers that Almighty God uses, as it is written in Mark 13, to witness against his false teachings. Uh, it's not going to make him happy, but do you know what? Are you worried about it? I'm not. That's our purpose. That's our destiny. And, and, and I'll reiterate, some people say, well, that kind of frightens me. Did it frighten the three Hebrew, Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? They heated it seven times hotter. Were they singed, scorched, and not one hair was bothered on them, and Christ walked with them in the flame. And he, in the same book again, Daniel in the lions did. Did the lions tear up Daniel? Of course not. Why? God closed their mouths. God takes care of his own. You don't have to worry. As it is written in Luke chapter 21, they cannot bother one hair on your head. Verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, between the Mediterranean Sea and Jerusalem, all right, on Mount Zion, of course. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Why not? God's going to destroy him. This is why Jesus would say when he was asked, when is the end going to be? And they were marveling at the buildings in Jerusalem. He said, you better look at them. When that time comes, there won't be a stone left standing atop another. God is going to cleanse it from Satan having taken it over and planted his, planting his palace. It will be cleansed and a way will be made across Kedron to the Mount of Olives whereby the way is made for God's own. And the city will be cleansed whereby it can be rebuilt for the, with and around the Millennium Temple. Chapter 12 and verse 1, let's complete the great book of Daniel. Verse 1 reads, And at that time shall Michael stand up. That means he makes his stand. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, the children of God both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one, I repeat, every one that shall be found written in the book. I don't know, are you? Are you in the book? I guarantee you, you're in there. It may not be the book of life, but you're there with all your deeds that you haven't repented of, both good and bad, recorded right there. And actually, when you repent, the bad is erased and the good stays. How much you got written by your name, it's important. If you be in that book of life, then you would have been one of God's elect. When, what, does this name Michael mean anything to you? It's the prince of our people, the archangel of our people. He is the one that we covered in the last, last lecture and the one before, he that leadeth until he be taken out of the way. It's Michael that boots Satan and his ten little buddies and others out of heaven, down onto the earth. It is also Michael that will come with his angels when it is time for the second tribulation. You see, there are two. The first tribulation is by the false messiah, that is to say, the spurious messiah, that's to say antichrist. And all it is, he's playing church peacefully and prosperously, paying all your bills, making life real good for you, friend, if you'll bow to him, if you'll leave off the Lord Jesus Christ and worship him because he claims to be Jesus Christ. The question is, do you know the difference? It's really pretty simple. A child could understand because the false comes in the sixth trump and the true Christ comes in the seventh. It's that simple. God has foretold us all things in this letter that he has written. And naturally, Michael, and this is why you will hear me on occasion, say it is not written in Revelation 20 which angels, which strong angel will cast Satan into the abyss, the pit, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out that it's always Michael that handles him, strong arms him. You heard about the great fight back in chapter 10 in this book of Daniel where Michael and both Gabriel were a little bit involved. Verse 2, and in other words, you, were, you had a time fixed there. It's just before the return of Christ. Verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, uh, many people here, they really, you know, it, it is amazing when you study God's Word and you know in your mind, as it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this flesh body is to be present with God. In other words, you're out of here, you're gone, you're back with the Father. As it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, as soon as this flesh body dies, the spirit, the intellect of the soul being the soul, instantly, that means right then, instantly, before you could ever put that body in the ground or cremate it, whichever way you chose, you're already back with the Father. Well, what does this mean, some will awake? Well, let me ask you something. How many do you think are spiritually asleep today? How many do you think that are spiritually deader than a doornail? They have no idea and no conception of what's going on in this world. They have no idea whatsoever of what time it is and what's transpiring. Therefore, inasmuch as God to some put a spirit of slumber upon them, they awake to reality, to truth, to knowledge and wisdom. And some of them are going to be real disappointed. Uh, let's put it this way. What is this dust of the earth? Who, who was cursed coming out the gate to, on his belly all the days of his life shall he crawl in the dust of the earth? earth. It, it, it is a statement of degradation against Satan and those that follow him. 
Uh, this doesn't mean people in a grave out there. The people that uh, their flesh bodies are placed in the ground are long gone, friend. That's why it is written in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we, there, we that are alive in no way can precede the dead. Why? They're already gone. They're already with him. So what it means is a lot of people, unfortunately, on that day are going to have a spiritual awakening, and it might be too late, okay, for some. Verse 3, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Put that old firmament when this earth before the catabole, before everything was put out a kilter where we have storms today, all that up over our head, filtering out every poisonous ray. It must have been something to see. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I don't know, are you, when, when our people stand up before the spurious Messiah, those trials will be publicized to the world. And the Holy Spirit will be speaking through you. You don't have to worry about being some big talker. The Spirit of God is going to speak through you, the Holy Spirit. And the truth will cover the world. They will have an opportunity to come to truth, to hear truth, for the truth shall prevail. And it will lead many into eternal life rather than death in the abyss. What a time to live. What a time to serve God. How are you doing? You know, this is no time for whiny babies, uh, prima donnas, or people that can't cut it. You either got it or you don't, and you get it from the Word of God. Verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, when we take this statement, run to and fro, many scholars have different opinions. Moffat translates it one way. Uh, it is real easy to to have a delete and a rash, and I know I'm going to be talking. I'm not talking over some people's head. I'm just saying I understand perfectly why there is confusion. It's real easy to mistakenly translate a rash to a delete or vice versa in the Hebrew alphabet. The difference in what it really says, and I will teach it so because I know it's accurate. What it says is, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of end, many shall run with wickedness and apostasy. Your companion Bible will basically back me up on this. It's true also from the Hebrew text. And knowledge shall be increased. It is for some people. But, you know, you're either deceived or you're not. And if you're not deceived, the Holy Spirit's going to increase knowledge in a bountiful way, perhaps like we've never seen before. You know, we, we can understand the Scripture, but we're going to have pertinent information, I mean, that is uh, pertinent to the very time in which this transpires, God leading His army, and you're part of it. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, the lip of it, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. What river is this? The Tigris. What's going on there today? Well, you check it out. This is where Babylon is, of old even. Verse 6, And one said to the man clothed in linen, that should say something to you. What is the linen? It's your righteous acts. He had a bunch of them. Uh, documentation, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Which was upon the waters of the river. How long, this is the question, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? When, when is, how long is all this going to go on? And tell me the date. When is, when is this going to conclude? Verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven. That is showing obeyance and um, openness to Almighty God. 
and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. That's three and a half times. And when he, he who, it's important that you know, the Antichrist, when he, the vile person, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. When one worldism comes into play, when he, the vile person, back in chap verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 21, when he, the uh, son of perdition from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, when that's all the same he, when he stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God, you're right at the door, my friend. You know, it'd be pretty hard. To, I mean, it'd be a good, any time's a good time to start holding Bible classes, but it'd be a little late in the day. I mean, we're about to change shifts at that time. I wonder how much you could learn in one night that would make you useful in a real battle. I wonder if God could really trust you if you waited till the last minute. I don't think so. Well, at least I'd try. Well, bless your heart, he counts that as perfect. Uh, maybe I don't understand. Well, I do understand. Why? Because he loves you. But I'm saying don't waste time. I'm not telling you at the same time to become a religious fanatic. You use common sense, horse sense. You figure things out. You act upon it. And you follow the plan of God. It's written exactly how it's going to happen. And naturally, we know, what does that three and a half times mean? Well, it takes you back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, when he said, in the middle of the week. Well, what's the middle of the week? Three and a half days. Got it? In the middle of the week, he, the spurious Messiah, is going to appear in Jerusalem claiming to be God. Okay? And actually that time has been shortened. And in the next uh, book I teach, the great book of Revelation, I will document exactly what it's been shortened to. Now, let's go on with the next verse, if we may. Verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. I, I was three and a half, three and a half times. What? Uh, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Question. Old Daniel wanted to know. Don't we all? Verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed. And they're closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, what, what do you read from that? Go your way, Daniel. I mean, it wasn't going to happen in Daniel's lifetime. And he said, It's going to be sealed up until the time of the end, meaning the people at the time of the end should be able to put it together. It's going to be unsealed. Why? Well, it's very simple. The things that were prophesied about concerning the parable of the fig tree being both the good and the bad fig transplanted back into Jerusalem, ordered to be built back to Messiah, both good and bad, uh, that is to say, good Messiah, but unfortunately also bad Messiah. And Satan will take advantage of this, uh, this truth. So what does that say to you? It should say to you that he's going to leave a, a panel open whereby at least we can see in, maybe dimly for some. But at least we should begin to understand the prophecy, hey, it's happening in our lifetime. That's kind of like, wake up. I, I wouldn't advise you to wait till Michael comes to wake up out of the dust of confusion. I, I would get my thinking bonnet on and I would concentrate on the Word of God. And what I couldn't absorb, I would pray to Him for understanding. Okay, let's go with the next verse, if we may. Verse 10. Many shall be purified. There's some eyes going to be opened. Good teaching will do it. The Word of God will do it. And made white, that means pure from being uh, indoctrinated into Satan's lies. And tried. I mean, you know, and tried means you're going to be tried in life. Well, I just want to live in my little rose garden and be a sweet little Christian. Hey, what happened to Christ do you think he had a sweet little rose garden life? No, they ended up crucifying him, many times trying to stone him. 
If you do what is right, you're going to be criticized when you're tried at times. But the wicked shall do wickedly. They're going to keep that up. You can count on it. What's new under the sun? Watch the news tonight. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Do you understand that? If you work at it, and if you are wise, you shall understand. That's a promise of God. And I'm going to guarantee you something. Anytime God makes a promise, he keeps his word. But every word is conditional, basically, that you must fulfill your obligation to open your mind, study the letter he has written to you, open your eyes to the events of the world, and look at your watch occasionally to see what time it is. And I, perhaps I should not use that analogy, it might throw some people off, but I mean look around you at the seasons. Because in this generation, we're supposed to understand the seasons, what's happening. Now let's go a little bit further here and see what we can come up with here. Verse 11. And verse 11 reads, now here's, here is your the answer, and it's a simple one. Don't make it complicated, let it flow. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. Understand, I've told you to watch that word set up. That's why uh, Nebuchadnezzar set up the image in the wilderness and caused the three children to worship it. Set up, being put in place. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, let me make something very clear. There's no need in you wrestling with that. When was the um, daily sacrifice taken away? Now, you're a Christian, you should know. I shouldn't have to even tell you. It was taken away, what, what was sacrificed for you as a Christian for one and all times? Jesus Christ, of course, his blood on the cross. It is an abomination for you to offer any kind of blood sacrifice after Christ died for one and all times for the sins of anyone that would believe upon him. When was the crucifixion? Well, just set it in your mind as A.D. 33. Now, there are scholars that will differ with that year. I, I'm not trying to set a date. I want you to know that. So I'm going to take 33. Some people think 27. Some people think 29. Some people think Christ was born in 2 B.C. And some people think he was born in 4 B.C. Can we absolutely document? Well, we can come pretty close, but 33 will work. Uh, we'll, we'll use that to, so that simply that you have the equation that establishes a formula whereby you can understand the seasons. Again, not the date. So, what is it then? Well, our Lord was crucified in 33 A.D. In the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, 1948, the, for the first time since Christ was crucified, uh, past A.D. 70, when Titus destroyed the, the so-called camp of Judah for the last time, up until the year of our Lord when it was reestablished in the year of our Lord, 1948, it was set up. And this fig tree was set out. You don't plant a seed for a fig tree. You set out a shoot. So the, it's 1948. So what, what is the difference here? It's saying that um, from, um, from the time of the crucifixion until the year of our Lord, 1948, there would be 1,290 days. So what does that mean to you? Well, it means that um, if you take the span of time from 33 A.D. to 1948 A.D., you have a common denominator that you can derive if you divide 1,290 days into that. Well, let's, let's have a look over here, if we may, at 
I mean, this is really some fancy cipher in here. You'll have to bear with me. I just whipped this out so that you would have something you could look at. The year of our Lord, 1948, Christ was born in the year 33, so we have to subtract those years. In other words, from 33 to 1948, there were 1915 of our years. And when you divide 1290 of Daniel's days into that 1915 years, you come up with 148449. Now, let's, uh, let's go one more verse, if we may, here on the Scripture. That, that, lets us know what one of, and that lets us know how long one of Daniel's days is compared to our time today. Now, now don't make that complicated. There's nothing complicated about it, okay? Uh, verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,300 in five and thirty days. Well, what, is, well, what in the world could that possibly mean? Just what it says. You're told that Michael is going to cast Satan into the pit. You're told that the second advent Christ is going to return. So 1335 is a time and a mark that you should be very aware of, meaning a benchmark to the finality, that is to say, as you come into the final days, before the Lord himself would return. Blessed are those that live in that year because they're going to see some things that are amazing. Well, let's find out when that year is. Let's go back to the chart one more time. Um, and here we go. Uh, 1335, uh, when we take that by that common denominator, it brings us to our year of the Lord, 1981.8. Now, again, I'm not trying to fix a date. I'm not trying to fix a date at all. Why? Well, we're not accurate. Now, if we were going to be real accurate, we'd have to go 1948 plus May the 15th, and I'm going by memory, somewhere along there, and 33 A.D., April the 1st, approximately. So you'd, you'd, and you'd have a lot of different times and everything in here. I, I don't want you to get the idea you've got to fix a date from this. I want you to grasp the season. Now, I told you to be very careful back in the great book of Daniel concerning the 2300 days. It was written there that there would be 2300 days of Daniel's days go by from the time that God cleansed the sanctuary for the last time, as you would read in the 23rd chapter of Joshua. And that particular time would be, okay? So when we multiply 2300 days times our common denominator of 14844, that's this number here of converting Daniel's days into our days, years, then we come up with uh, roughly 3414 years. Naturally, that happened 1433 BC. So we have to subtract for, uh, the last time the sanctuary was cleansed by God himself, and as he stipulated in Joshua 23, this is the last time I'm going to do it until the end when Christ returns. Last time. So you have to subtract that 1,433 years from that 3414, and you come up with 1981, both figures being the same in Daniel's uh, reckoning and time. And again, I want to make it very, very clear. I am not setting a date. I'm setting a season whereby you can understand, well, what happened in 1981? Well, there were many things. Mount St. Helen erupted and we saw a face in a cloud letting us know. And we were told to mark that time that nothing would ever be the same. And it's not. We were told that from the minor prophets. It's never been the same, and it's not going to be again. It is very strange that it was about that same time that this ministry, which was a little church of 120 in northwest Arkansas, has exploded in teaching this deception that Antichrist would bring all the way around the world and many others tying into it. We are living in a very exciting time. 
even the prophets wanted to live in this generation. We've got work to do. We've got things to do. It isn't really we that do it. The Holy Spirit does. So many things are transpiring in this generation. You want to pay very strict attention. You can play with those numbers all you want to. I want to reiterate again, I am not setting dates. I am pointing out seasons that the wise are supposed to understand. It's important that you're not deceived. You live in that time span. You live in that generation. Now, verse 13 to complete the book. But go thy way, uh, go, but go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And Daniel will stand there. Daniel is standing there. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. Daniel will be brought back with Almighty God along with Isaiah and many others, all the prophets, to a battle that will transpire and everything will be set back right. But there is work for God's elect that they must do during the time of the sixth trump, which is the deception of the vile person. We will follow this teaching up with the book of Revelation, which is an overlay. The word revelation, regardless of what language you wish to translate it, means the uncovering the unveiling or God making known to you things that are written. Again, I want to re-quote from Mark 13. God said, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Where in the book have you read it? Have you thought on it? There's no need for anyone to be biblically, biblically illiterate. Concentrate, meditate, upon your father's word. Great book of Daniel. What a, what a book. How exciting. Jesus himself made it a part of the New Testament in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. All right, bless your hearts. Next lecture, we'll begin the great book of Revelation. Don't miss it. Listen a moment.